Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Roughly two weeks ago now, I put together the first ever replying to comments episode, and it was really well received. You guys seem to enjoy it quite a bit, and there were loads of requests for more episodes. So I plan to create one every two to three weeks, depending on what content we've got out, and if there's anything worth following up on. Recently, I released a video I'd been working on for a little over a week. It was my used GPU comparison covering about 60 different GPU models. Now, that video was extremely well received and I can't thank everyone enough who liked the video and took the time to leave a nice comment. I uh, very much enjoyed reading all your comments and your feedback and all that sort of stuff. I wish I could have responded to all of it, but at least I was able to read every last one. So again, thank you, very much appreciate it. There were, however, a few comments that stuck out and I felt warranted uh, more of an in-depth response. So I've decided to make another reply into comments episode so that I could do just that. So. Let's get into it. Right, so as I said, a lot of you really liked the used GPU comparison, and I noticed a lot of requests for the same sort of video, but with a focus on CPUs. Uh, I really hate to deny you guys content. Uh, a lot of the videos we make are subscriber requested, so we certainly appreciate your feedback. Unfortunately though, a CPU version, I don't really see how it's possible. Basically used CPUs are significantly more difficult uh, to make this kind of content for than used GPUs, and there's just a number of reasons for this. Firstly, you're not just buying the CPU, at least in most cases, you're not just buying the CPU. Uh, more often than not, secondhand shoppers are in need of not just the CPU, but also the motherboard and memory. So it'd be more of a platform comparison, and with that pricing, just it can vary massively. Uh, so can availability, and then the quality of the parts. That'll also vary quite a bit as well. Then you have to take other things into account, such as overclocking headroom, power consumption, platform features, security issues, CPU features, and so on. In the case of the GPU, it just slots into a PCI Express slot on any old system. Uh, you might require one to two external power connectors, but that's about it. So for CPUs, I do prefer to review them uh, individually, test out their platforms and all that kind of stuff, and I do quite a bit of that each year. Right now though, I recommend most of you uh, secondhand shoppers invest in well, the AM4 platform. There's loads of cheap first gen Ryzen CPUs on sale, and if you buy a B350 board, you'll be able to take advantage of the Zen 2 processors that will be released later in the year. The only recommendations I'd really make is, I personally would avoid the AMD FX range like the plague, uh, as well as any really old Intel CPUs, even those cheap X58 Xeon models, uh, just not worth the drawbacks unless you can get them for basically next to nothing. Anything Haswell or newer from Intel is worth considering at the right price, but again, I would recommend focusing your attention on cheap AM4 deals. Okay, next up we have a comment here from Andre, and he pointed out uh, that this is, well, there was a bit of an opportunity miss, let's say, and that was to sort the graphs by the cost per frame. Honestly, I had considered doing this. Uh, in fact, I did actually do it. I sorted the graph uh, by the cost per frame and had a look at it, but for me, it didn't really make sense. Uh, it wasn't really the best way to analyze the data. Even so, this video does give me a chance to include that graph. Now, the reason I didn't include it in the original video is because while a GPU might offer a low cost per frame, which is certainly good, the actual performance could, well, suck, making it pointless. Take the R7 265, for example, it offers the best cost per frame, but you'd be worlds better off spending $22 more on average on the 285 as it offers over 50% more performance and a significantly better gaming experience. We see that the GTX 580 also ranks really well, but you wouldn't touch that thing with a 50 foot pole. The GTX 570 is in the same boat here and there are a few others as well. Anyway, it's not a bad way to arrange the data. I just felt it would be less confusing to the viewer only to show the massive graph once and arranging by performance makes it much easier for you to locate a cost-effective GPU that will deliver the kind of performance you deem acceptable. Anyway, certainly not a bad suggestion and I appreciate the comment and I hope Andre is happy that I was now able to provide that graph. Moving on for the next series of comments, I'm not gonna call anyone out as that's not really necessary. Uh, but it is an interesting, it's an interesting point of view, so I thought I would discuss it, at least give my two cents on it. So a few people were criticizing my choice of using the medium quality settings at 1080p rather than ultra. Uh, one of the arguments I saw was that reviewers test at 1080p primarily using ultra quality settings, so using medium paints an unrealistic picture. Uh, just on that note, if I had a dollar for every time one of these arguments ended with words such as misleading, uh, unrealistic, or pointless, I'd have many more dollars than I do.
Anyway, at its core, it is a fair criticism, and believe me, as someone who often tests PC hardware under various conditions with a wide range of settings, uh, having to land on just one, uh, yeah, that's something I agonized over for quite some time before I got benchmarking. In the end, I considered the massive list of graphics cards, quite a few of them packed less than 4GB of VRAM, and many were around 6 years old. After all, we're talking about used graphics cards here, not the latest and greatest tech. Hell, I don't even review brand new entry level or budget GPUs with ultra quality settings, so it doesn't really seem right to do that with half decade old hardware, or even older graphics cards. Moreover, I feel medium was highly realistic. Who's honestly buying a GeForce 600 or 700 series graphics card and running with the ultra quality preset enabled in games such as Battlefield or Tomb Raider? Really, ultra would have broken so many of these GPUs and completely skewed the cost per frame data. Meanwhile, the medium preset did nothing to hurt or skew the cost analysis of the higher end models such as Vega 64 and the GTX 1080, for example. Having said all that, let me know what you guys think. Uh, is medium the right choice for this kind of content, or next time should I upgrade to high or even the ultra quality settings? Uh, just quickly here, a uh, shout out to my man, Timmy Joe. He makes videos on the internet about PC parts. He also picked up an R9 270X for $6 Canadian, which is about $45 US, and that's $6 below the average selling price that we found in December. So. He must know what he's doing. Uh, if you haven't checked out Timmy Joe's PC tech channel, I recommend you do. He's a bit of a wild man and his content's always a lot of fun. Something I did look over was the fact that eBay often offers five, 10, or even up to 15% discounts to try and entice buyers. And they did a lot of that in December because it's sort of the holiday thing leading up to Christmas. They try to move as much stuff as they can on the platform. So yeah, it explains why I was scratching my head so much wondering why so many uh, graphics cards, say the GTX 1050 Ti, sold for around $700 or even a little over $700. But if you apply a 10% discount, then you're getting down towards $600. And then with a 15% discount, you end up below $600. So yeah, not really a bad deal after all. Also, I should note that, that can throw out my cost per frame uh, numbers. Can throw them out a little bit, but given the discounts were universal across all graphics card sales, it's probably not having that much of an impact. Still, something to be aware of next time when I do update this video, and thank you to everyone who pointed it out. Uh, yeah, that was a bit of an oversight on my behalf. I thought I'd made another oversight when Xali Thor, not sure about that one, and Patrick pointed out a bit of an odd result. The GTX 780 was better than or really on par with the R9 290 and GTX 970. The uh, 780 also knocked off the 3 GB GTX 1060. So yeah, that didn't seem quite right. However, I did go back and I checked the results all over again and no mistakes were made. So whew. it does seem like the medium quality settings really helps out the GTX 780. Uh, performance did get a bit crippled when I went back and tested those tiles with Ultra. It wasn't horrible, but it didn't stack up nearly as well against the more modern cards and then some of the other cards like the R9 290. So this made me think I need to start testing these older GPUs at 1080p using two or three different quality presets. Uh, normally I just use sort of an ultra or very high quality preset. So yeah, something to think about when I do the revisits of the older graphics cards. I also checked out some other games, For Honor, Forza Horizon 4, and even Fortnite. And again, found with medium quality settings that the 780 does really well. So yeah, very interesting. Okay, so viewer Wicked Ribbon has a word of warning for us, and it's something I did consider uh, getting into with the used GPU guide, but in the end decided against it. I really just wanted to stay on topic, the core topic, uh, as much as I could, and that was just to you know, focus on price versus performance. Anyway, his warning is to be careful about buying graphics cards from miners cryptocurrency miners. We're not talking about young children here. Uh, he purchased two RX 570s that came with modified BIOSes, and he found this broke driver support with newer drivers. Of course, it is possible to reflash graphics cards, so this isn't an end of world type scenario, but you do need to be a little tech savvy, as well as be willing to deal with uh, these potential issues in the first place. Generally, I wouldn't really worry that much about buying an X mining graphics card. Uh, if you can get one for a bargain, then yeah, I would just go for that. A uh, secondhand shopping is a risk period, and I know plenty of people who have bought cheap mining graphics cards over the past few years, and they've had no issues whatsoever. Of course, if you are in a position where you can test the card before you buy, for example, you can drive over to the seller's house, uh, place some load under it in a game, 
listen out for things like excessive coil wine and keep your eyes peeled for any artifacts, then yeah, I suggest doing that. That would obviously be an ideal situation for buying a secondhand product. Uh, generally though, my own experiences buying secondhand graphics cards have been very good. I scored a nice comment here from Ferns with a request to see a uh, behind the scenes video uh, showing the process of making sort of the used graphics card guide. Uh, I have had these sorts of requests before, but honestly, it it really is extremely boring. Uh, yeah, it's seriously boring. It's about on par with watching paint dry, if I'm honest. Uh, benchmarking itself is extremely boring. It's not really, a, it's not a great spectator sport. And then looking at eBay listings over and over again, well, that's, that's torturous. That's, that's really bad viewing. So I think I'll spare you guys the behind the scenes video for this kind of testing and analysis. Last comment, this one is from Aku, uh, but I did see quite a few comments like this, so I thought it was probably worth addressing. So the claim is that graphics card pricing is very volatile and the figures in the video uh, will be inaccurate by the time it's released. Uh, it's certainly true that PC hardware pricing is volatile, especially for graphics cards. That said, the demand from mining is over now and we've pretty well settled into the RTX release cycle. So yeah, it's not really shaking things up there for the used market. So prices seem pretty steady now. The prices provided were based on the average selling price in December. In the case of the GTX 1070, that figure was $248 US. I just tallied up the latest dozen 1070 sold on eBay over the past few days and the average selling price came out to $247 US. So pricing seems pretty consistent so far and I don't expect the RTX 2060 to shake things up much. And if anything, it will drive the GTX 1070, 1070 Ti and 1080 pricing down. So obviously that's a good thing for buyers. You can expect the next big pricing shakeup to come once AMD release their next gen mid-range GPUs, and that's expected to come sometime later in the year. And I think that will do it for this episode of Reply in the Comments. Uh, again, I seriously appreciate the overwhelming uh, positive feedback on that video. Uh, everyone that stopped and gave it a like and a comment and all that, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it was great to read over all those comments and even hear your thoughts and feedbacks and suggestions, ideas, all that kinds of stuff. It was really cool. And yeah, all that great positive energy will certainly help motivate me to do it all over again in three to six months from now, whenever it's required. But yeah, not looking forward to it, but since you guys appreciate it, enjoy it so much, I will get through that one. Uh, also coming up on the channel in a few days, I have a massive, a yeah, truly massive benchmark comparison between the RX 570 and GTX 1050 Ti. Uh, many of you have pointed out that I've been recommending the RX 570 for months now, but I haven't created an updated benchmark. All the stuff I have is quite outdated. So yeah, since that is the case, I will be correcting it. And that is going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the testing, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the word at Box, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for watching. I am your host, Steve. See you next time.